Floss Tube. It's Arlene here. It is Saturday, September 17th, 2022. Been a few weeks, but I'm glad to be back here doing a video. If you have stumbled upon me by chance, welcome. I'm so glad that you've stopped by for a visit. We all know there's tons of videos out there um, of floss tubers sharing their stitching, and thank you for stopping to see mine. Uh, the term floss tube mostly gets used referring to cross stitch cross stitchers. Um, I do a lot of different kinds of needlework and so if you're interested in seeing some different stuff including a bunch of thread talk today please stay around and if you are returning thank you so much again knowing there's so many places you could go I appreciate you being here today. Uh, last time I was here I was sharing about the Needlework Expo. I am a designer. Um, I did, my designer name is Works by ABC and I participated in Expo. It, it's a, it was an online virtual market. So designers, mostly pattern designers, but there were some thread companies and fabric companies, are at home in their own spaces um, and store owners can bounce around online and even enter your room and have a video chat with you uh, to place orders. And it's a time of year where a lot of um, uh, designers are coming out with new things and perhaps you have already benefited from that. I uh, will be putting my expo releases, I'll be making them available in my Etsy store in a couple of weeks, giving that about a month time to for the stores to, get a, give, them a to give them a chance to do some selling. Um, so you can look for those uh, in a few weeks and also check my Instagram because I'm sure I'll post there when I do that. I am going to jump right into some things here. So I wonder how many of you have gotten your Christmas ornaments from Just Cross Stitch, the ornament issue for 2022. This is the fourth year, 19, 20, 21, I think fourth year that I have had an ornament in here and I am pleased to share with you. So mine shows up at the, in the last chapter, shall we say? I guess that's what, I don't even know, section? Um, the section that is titled Yuletide in Blue. And when I, I guess when I was submitting the paperwork, they give a list of the likely used chapters. I think sometimes they adjust those slightly. And I'm like, oh yeah, they're putting me in that section. So this was the ornament that is in there. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Number one, I stitched it in a toile and the uh, instructions don't make note of that. And I even went back and checked my like, you know, paperwork pieces and I, I included that that was the thread I used. So mine has, uh, it's always hard to see a bit of a sparkle to it, if you can see that. Um, but it also means from a distance in the picture in here, it almost looks like it was gray or a light gray. But no, it is a 12, it has a nice sparkle. So I called it Symbols of the Seasons. And I, um, it could look just like a lovely little geometric design. But if you look closely, you will see, okay, trees and stars. But there are also dreidels and a very stylized candles. And of course, some snowflakes. So as with the ornament I had last year, just the acknowledgement that there's a lot of families out there that are celebrating both holidays. Uh, and um, obviously they call it the Christmas ornaments. Obviously that is the main focus, but it's nice to have some options for those who want to include them. So, uh, and again, I was aiming for, oops, in general, lovely, cute, and it takes really looking at it to know what's there. So a little combination of Christmas and Hanukkah in my ornament this year. I used a, a thing, it was a 32 count navy linen, Zweigart linen, and like I said, the etoile. So, and of course, as always, you don't have to stitch this or anything else using the called for colors and fabric. You can, absolutely. Which is why I wanted to make sure people knew I used etoile and not just the, the white that it's listed as. Um, but, Maybe you have some other thoughts on how you want to change up colors or how you want to present a stitching piece. You should always do it that. What works for you? Okay, next up on my list, because I have a little list here. Uh, summer tends to be the, the county fair, the state fair season of the year. Obviously, it varies the exact time period. My area, it's very much in the summer. I know some of the 
very warm areas, Texas and Arizona and so on, it's a little bit either much earlier or later because of the heat. Um, I did not send any participate in any local fairs around here, but one thing I have sent uh, pieces to for the last number of years um, is the ANG American Needlepoint Guild uh, exhibition that takes place at their yearly seminar. And yes, the word needlepoint is a part of that ANG, but really it's a lot of different needlework types. It is not limited to like the needlepoint tent stitch fully coverage that perhaps you're thinking of. Um, and I know that when I first discovered the, the, I, the exhibition, you know, I, I'd already been a member purely to get the magazine because there's a lot of good things in there. Um, I remember thinking, well, this feels like it's going to be high quality stuff. What's what do I really want to give it a try? I'm like, yes, you should always give it a try. If you have an opportunity to share your needlework in the world, do it. Um, yes, ribbons and awards are lovely and wonderful when they come. Um, but really, it's it's the spirit of, of sharing what you love and what you do and knowing there'll be plenty of people who will admire it. Uh, so the ANG, I can remember the first time I even said, well, maybe I will send something. They separate, um, they don't use amateur, professional and non-professional. That's what they do. So basically anyone who's a teacher, a designer who is in effect making money from their needlework is a professional. So for many years when I was first, again, I'm going to say 10 years, probably about 10 years that I've been sending things. Um, I was under a non-professional and just, so it was canceled in 2020. There was some sort of virtual thing going on in 2021, which I did not participate in. So in 2019 was the last time I had entered anything in their seminar exhibit. And that was the first year I did it as a professional. And so it's sort of like, I mean, I see some of these names. I've met a lot of these people and I'm like, they are experts. They've been doing this for a while. Um, but again, you never know. I wish that ANG um, put on display, like online, to be found online, the exhibit. Uh, they, December, uh, in a, a couple of issues from now, is going to be the magazine that shows all the award winners. And so that's the opportunity where you can see, obviously not everything, you're only seeing those that won awards. Um, and as part of this, you have to sign off on a, um, ANG is allowed to take pictures kind of uh, thing. So if you've already signed off that they're allowed to take pictures, why can't they already also post them online for people to admire and appreciate? So I don't have the answer to that. I'm just saying I wish it was the case, especially when you send something in and you're not there and you just sort of wonder, well, how did it do? <laughs> so um, a year ago, in August of 2021, this was one of my new releases for Expo that year, and it's called Elegant Lace, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about, well, let me just, <laughs> so um, I'd stitched on a green silk weaver fabric. It is stitched with uh, floche, which I'll talk about in a moment, that's what I meant, as well as floss, and it is one of a number of pieces that I've done that have been inspired by actual pieces of lace, most often like a tablecloth. So I loved the way it turned out. I thought, all right, I'm going to send it in. And I come back with a third place ribbon. Um, as a friend of mine said, well, the white matches the, the stitching. It looks perfect. I'm like, yeah. Um, and again, for me, knowing, I, I don't know who entered, there's different categories. So this is in the adaptation category where you also have to send images of what is it that you adapted it from, um, like a dishware or a, Whatever else, I, I don't know off the top of my head what other things are in the category. So professional in the adaptation category. And you know, again, I wish I could see because I know what came in first and second must be pretty amazing. So there, I know that everything in that exhibit is pretty amazing. Each, when I finally get the um, issue each year and I'm flipping through and it's like, there's so many things I'm like, oh, I wish I could see that in person. I wish I could have seen, I wish I could have studied that close up. Um, and the only time I had ever done that, which was actually the first year I entered was when A&G was in Philadelphia, which is a drive, hour, 15 hour and a half for me. 
and I drove down for like the um, open to the public days. And that was the only time I've been able to go and see what the exhibit is all about. But because of that one time, I have this vision of how it's laid out and, and so on. So ANG, I enjoy being a part of the exhibition each year. I have never attended the seminar as a student. Who knows? Maybe one day. We'll see. Um, as where um where was I going with that? Oh, not last video, but the video before. I believe I spent most of that video talking about the stitching retreat I had, New Jersey Floss Tube Retreat in July. Um, and I I have to go back and double check. I don't. Know, it doesn't even matter. Uh, after that retreat, a lot of people post pictures of uh, talk about and uh, videos and post pictures and everything. Danielle Citerisa shared on her vlog of the retreat a magazine that she picked up from the freebie table. And it had this image, and there's a whole personal story for her of having seen that many years ago, and finally in her you know, she's encountered it again in her life kind of thing. And when she held it up on her video, I was just like, wow. And she was talking a little bit about it and saying that it said that they stitched it on... Um, 28 count over one. And that's a little smaller than what she usually does. But I was just so taken by this image that I got in touch with her and I, and she let me borrow her pattern. And then when I posted about this, somebody sent me the magazine. So I now have that magazine. So this is Stitcher's World, um, July, 2003. So it's, you know, 19 years old. And it's this rose that, like I said, or it was on the cover. She knew it was on the cover. She didn't know what magazine it was. Um, and there it is. And I just, it just really grabbed me. So I started stitching it. And as I joke, this is my purple mountain. And I actually have a piece of paper behind it so that you could see. I'm stitching it on 40 count silk gauze because I just wanted to. Um, the 28 count over one, wait, I think when she mentioned that on the video, it just got me thinking. Um, I've stitched a few pieces on silk gauze. It is stitching. You usually only do a tenth stitch because it's so small you can't do a full cross stitch. 40 count, I would say, is the most common size, but you can get other sizes of it. Um, and it's usually something you stitch over one. It also, let me say this, has to be full coverage? No, it doesn't have to be. So here's the rose getting started. And if I just move this ever so slightly, if you've never seen, oh, look, you can see me. <laughs> if you've never seen silk gauze before, um, it, you know, it's almost like needle point where you might want to do a full coverage. But when I finish this, you know, I, I will you know, frame it in a square shape. And so it'll just sort of, it's like it's floating. That's, that's the look I'll be going for. So here's, let me get you both in. I think I got you both in there. Um, and it is a project that uh, I'll work on a little bit at a time. When, when I started Floss Tube, I didn't know that there were people who worked on more than one project at a time. And I, I have not, I know there's many people who have many, many whips, and I've never gone to that degree. But I do have a few things going on, mostly because of designing reasons. Um, uh, and so having uh, most of what I stitch is the pieces that I'm designing. I stitch my models. Uh, it's sort of like, I don't want to design something that I personally wouldn't want to stitch. Like it doesn't have any interest to me. And so therefore I end up stitching all my models and I don't know, we'll see if that ever changes. Um, but it is nice to have a, something different every so often. And so a silk gauze piece, which requires some intense focus on the design and I'll ju and I'm just going to give you a very quick show to see yeah that's what the pattern looks like so um people have asked me how many threads it includes total it's it's about 20 I think um basically pinks and greens uh, so I will keep you all posted and again follow my Instagram you can learn more as that evolves and it'll be in, like I, I finished off in effect a row like as people who do haids kind of do boxes of 10 I wasn't quite doing that but that's the idea I thought you know what this is a good stopping point let me go back to some of my cross stitch 
and when I'm ready for a break, I'll be back at that. Um, what else have I been stitching? Again, two videos ago, I was talking to you about a uh, type of needlework called Ukrainian drawn thread. And Marika, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Yvette Stanton has put out a number of books, um, which I'm going to share in a moment, and all about different styles of embroidery, almost all of them related to, uh, almost all of them types of white work around the world. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I love cross stitch. I first started stitching just cross stitch. And then about a year after I was at a college, I, I was living in a place and I walked into a needlework store and saw, oh my God, there's all this other stuff that's possible. And so that's why I've ever since then picked up different techniques and kind of rotate to what I'm interested in. And frankly, it was because of the amount of conversation and things found online related to Ukraine in the beginning of this year, which I should say there's still a lot to be found online, but it was this Ukraine thinking that reminded me of this. I did not own the book. I did get it at that time. It is not hard anger. So when you see fabric that has threads that have been pulled away, a lot of stitchers think that's hard anger. And sometimes it is, and this one isn't. It's a different style. It involved learning, trying to follow the, um, the path that the threads take. And I should have had a dark thing to show this with. Oh, oh I, there we go. Um, so it's a little sampler looking thing. I could cut it out and fray the edges and call it a bookmark. I won't. Um, just for me, I wanted to play, I wanted to learn something new. And this was the right thing at the right time. Um, will I do any of the other designs in the book? I don't know, maybe. Um, it did remind me of the books that I do own of hers that I have not stitched from. And so that I remember going, oh, I gotta go see what's on my bookshelf there. And so I have shared this in the past. Um, this may have been the first of her books that I got called Portuguese White Work, Bullion Embroidery from Winmar. I'm not going to say it correctly. Uh, and I know that I got this because at the time, I and I still do, reading Mary Corbett's blog called Needle and Thread, and she does book reviews. And, and I remember seeing the book review for this and saw, wow, that looks really cool. And I got the book. And, you know, boy, have I learned since then. Because the picture that Mary Corbett had posted on her blog, well, I think it was probably more than one, was this. And this is what made me say, wow, that looks cool. Now, I could have decided whether or not I liked the technique if I made like one square. <laughs> and I know I did a little sample, you know, just kind of tested out this whole idea of doing bullions. There's a, oh, look, and I have the papers in here. I wrote it down. The piece I did has 2,156 bullions in it. I mean, that's really what this type, this style of stitching is about. So I just jump right in. And I know in the middle of it is when I was thinking, why did I commit myself to such a large piece? But I enjoyed it. Um, although the one day, so you can see um, the, the edges involve uh, cutting out the threads and wrapping what's left. And I'm doing it by rows and I use on a scroll frame. So I've rolled up and I go to start cutting and then I hmm, pause. Yeah, I had started, this is a six by six. I had started a seventh row. Like I'd cut the threads. There was no going back. And the only thing to do is go forward. And so my piece is six by seven instead of six by six. Uh, great lesson for, you know, double, triple checking when you're doing something like this. When it comes to anything related to stitching that truly is um, not fixable, you, you can't go back. You put in a wrong stitch in one place, you can get out, get it out. Um, you use the wrong color, you can take it out. You cut the wrong threads in hard anger. There are depend. Actually, I should say this: in any in any style that has cut threads involved, depending on what you did, there may be ways to fix it or to fudge it. This, there was no way to fudge it. So you can see, and I know I've shown this before, those are all bullion stitches. Um, and I even did the edging in a, I don't know, I guess 
some sort of edging thing. Uh, and I am looking at it like, what thread did I use? I'm going to, th oh, <laughs> that's what I think about. Um, yeah, number, I was going to say it's, it was, it's mostly a, not, it is number eight pearl cotton, pearl cotton weave. And I think probably 36 came out. Anyway, so I know this was the first book of Yvette Stanton's that I'd gotten. I loved it so much. I started um, looking at the other things that she put out. I cannot tell you in what order, but I did proceed over the years to get her Sardinian knot embroidery, her Montmelia, Montmelic, Montmelic embroidery, early style hardanger, and this is it's really interesting to see because she researches, she she does like on the ground, in the museums, in the archives, this she's, I think that's why I like her work so much is that she's really into giving the full background and in finding styles that are not well known. And what is not well known is how Hardanger has evolved. So early style out of Norway um, has some definite differences between what we think of as Hardanger here in the 21st century as we're stitching it. Um, so have I stitched anything from these three books? No. Um, as I was working on the Ukrainian bo uh, book and realizing she set it up with um, a couple of small sampler pieces, um, most of her others, she's done something like that. And yes, I picked these up and I was tempted. It, there are projects in here that are now on my list and I hope I do return to them. But I couldn't leave enough alone. I also got, this is recent, her book, that is also a style from Norway, and it's the only one of her books that is not white work. And this one I was looking, I, now I forget now, I was practicing before I started the video, because in my mind I call it smog, and that's not the way to pronounce it. It is smoogy, smoogig, smoogig, I think. But it's an ooh, like, you know, uh, book. It's like book, smoog, smog. Go watch her video. She's from Australia. She pronounces everything correctly. Um, and it's it's a much simpler style in terms of, of technique, um, but there's some really unique pieces to it that intrigue me. And so like the others, it's going on the, yes, someday I'm going to do something from this book list. Uh, oops. So the Ukrainian white work, I finish this, work on the rose. So I know a lot of floss tubers show, you know, the work they've been doing that week or, you know, especially those who do floss tube like every week or every two weeks or whatever, there's always lots of progression to show. Um, as I said before, because most of what I'm doing is my own designs, I am mostly have been waiting until an item, is, a, a piece is done and ready to be purchased before I share it. And, you know, I go back and forth with this because, sure, that's that's the way it's usually done. And usually when you see a finished item, it gets the excitement way more than showing little pieces as you go along. And at the same time, there are things I'd want to share, you know. Um, so I, I just brought up this is another example of one of my lace pieces. And this um, is called hair, heirloom lace. And what made this one different is that this was one that I was sharing on my Instagram and pr I'm probably on floss tubes as well as I went. I don't know how much that was a conscious decision other than the fact this, I want to say past tense was, um, my pandemic, I don't want to call it pandemic project, my quarantine project. I started this on February 29th. I just know because it's the 29th and it wasn't purposely a February 29th start. It just happened to be the day. So it's a very clear memory. I started this on February 29th of 2020. And just a couple weeks later, the world started to change. And I know as I was stitching this, or maybe as I started it, I had no, I, I'd already designed it and I thought this is going to take some time. I finished it on June 1st, June, June 1st, June 2nd. So basically three months time, which I don't think I would have done that quickly if it wasn't for the um, amount of time spent at home. So I bring this up just to share with you that there, this was a one clear example of a time that I stitched um, and shared as I went. And it's like the piece I'm doing right now, which I'll give you a hint, is a, is a new lace design. And the goal is it will be a uh, Nashville market release in March. Um, it's like I want to share because <laughs> I, I like the way it's coming out. Um, 
and I just at this time have chosen not to. That may or may not change. Um, there's another reason I brought this piece up, but, oh, let me do this first, and then we'll go back to these. Um, so, but one thing I did want to share, just because I think it's unique, is the fabric that my new piece is on. Now, I didn't bring the piece up here. I stitched, doesn't matter. I'm in my loft. I don't have the project up here. But I do have another piece of this fabric, because I think this is pretty new and different, and maybe a lot of people have not heard of it. So this is a Zweigart fabric. And as always, when you do these videos, um, you are not going to get the right view of it. Uh, I found it my LMS, uh, Needleworkers Delight, which has a Zweigart, um, they're just Zweigart's distributor. And I remember, I was about a year or so, I saw this under their 36 count. Now they're calling it Vintage Lantern, 36 count Vintage Lantern. And at least at the time, in the conversation I had at the time, this color only came as 36. It was a 36 count. It was a new fabric, a new color that Zweigart was doing. I just, I loved, because you so rarely can find a dark color at 36. I shouldn't say in a dark color. I don't see too many dark colors at 36 count. And when I'm doing like my lace designs and monochrome design, this is exactly what I wanted. So I purchased a piece and then got another piece another time. Now, what's interesting, so I, it's mm, coming across as gray, which it definitely has gray, but it also has these like purplish undertones. So I brought, a, I took out a few threads. Let me see if I can get them lined up so you can see the colors. So 29 and 3740, when you hold like, and these are the closest purples I could come up with, it clearly doesn't look purple, okay? Definitely you see the grays. But then, let me get my um, try and grab these so you can see the numbers also. Yep, here's some, a bunch of different grays. Um, what do I have? 37, 9, 37 99, 413, 535, and 317. And I think you're, you, you can see a little bit of the purplish tone when I hold that up. So there really is no good. DMC that'll match it. So even if, you know, in a perfect world, I would say this matches to DMC, blah, blah, blah. And you go and look at that DMC. I'm like, oh, that's the color. Now, I made a comment about the name, Vintage Lantern. To my understanding from the guys at, at Needleworkers, the Zweigart doesn't have names on their fabric and the names kind of come into being in the when they get to the US. I might not be saying that correctly because I haven't seen Vintage Lantern anywhere. However, if you go on um, one, two, three stitch, which I did, you will see a fabric they call Magical Gray. And you'll only see it in 36 count. And um, when it says Zweigart number 7021, and the bottom of mine says 7021. So I think what, uh, one, two, three is calling magical gray is what I have in my hands. So if this is a color that intrigues you, that's what I can offer in terms of where you might find it. Or, you know, ask your own LNS or, find, you know, vintage lantern is what I have it called. Magical gray, I believe is the same thing. It's a neat fabric and I'm glad that I can be stitching on it. Um, so like I said, that it's, it's another piece that I have that I'm working on. Um, Next up, if you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen that last week, hmm, yeah, about a week ago, I was in Philadelphia. Um, I didn't share specifically what I went, the main purpose, which is actually a needlework thing, doing a little research. I'm so excited when I will get the chance to share with you some of the research projects I've been doing and um, that I'm hoping will lead to needlework pieces. But if you've never been to Philadelphia, or if you, if you had, there is a amazing needle point store. And I say that because their, their focus is needle point, painted canvases, all of that. And by amazing, it's about the threads they have. It's like they have the full colors of all these different lines. Now, a lot of their threads are needle point focused. A lot, they have like, I don't know if it's a full, but a whole lot of rainbow gallery, all those different kinds of threads. They have, um, I'm not going to be able to list them all, but 
they do have like the full line, I think is the full line of weeks and uh, gentle arts. So there's certainly threads to be found that can work within a fabric and not a canvas. And I went just because it had been a few years since I'd been there. I have ordered from them. Great customer service when I've ordered from them online. Um, and I, what did I call? I'm, sh I'm pretty sure they have a website that's set up for great online ordering. Um, and so if you're ever looking for a specific thread, Rittenhouse Needlepoint. Um, it is right, <laughs> literally right across the street from the convention center, if you're familiar with Philadelphia at all, and Reading Terminal, which is like this big, wonderful eatery place. Convention Center, Reading Terminal, Rittenhouse Needlepoint. They're on the second floor of a building with an elevator. Um, and if nothing else, to go see the threads. Uh, if you check out my Instagram, I, I tried to post pic I posted pictures, but they just don't give you the real sense of what it is. I'm bringing this up because of another thread thing or color thing here, um, which I just I'm so intrigued by. So, as I said before, the elegant lace as well as the heirloom lace are both stitched with floche. And floche, it's not a common thread to find, but you can easily find it online. Um, I've bought it from Etsy sellers. Uh, I guess that's, yeah, that's where I've gotten it from. Personally, I think one of the reasons it is not as well known in our cross stitch world is because it only comes in huge hanks like this. And I, this is something like 150 yards. Um, and so it's not very practical if you're stitching a nine of them has 12 different color threads to get, they don't, and there's nowhere near the color palette for uh, Flush. However, uh, one of the reasons, there's a number of reasons why I love it. The, both those projects, as well as the one I'm doing right now, were on 36 count. And I want it, there's areas where I definitely want a solid look to it. Um, and 36 count, as we all know, is that, that place, the, that in-between place. Some people like stitching one strand, some people like stitching two strands. If I want real full coverage, I'd want to go two strands. I also want to be a little lazy. And if I could avoid stitching with two strands, and wanting to lay the threads and make sure it's okay, I will. Now, some of you are probably saying sulky. The sulky petites, which they advertise as, I think they advertise as two, the equivalent of two strands of DMC, and, and many stitchers are more like, yeah, it's about one and a half, but, and I've tested that out. I still was looking for something more, and I, I can't tell you when I first learned about this or knew it, and then when I tested, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to use. So it's a very soft thread, and I, I like using it. Not everyone does. Um, and again, it's not, you know, it's not like you could go buy one 75 cent skein and see what you think of it. Um, how much is this? It's like $7 maybe for like 150 yards. So I've stitched with Floche before, the piece I'm working on now with Floche. Um, the Elegant Lace was in Blanc, not 5200. The Heirloom Lace was 712, like one of those light, light ecru kind, not a crew, but one of those kinds. Um, so they had all the floche colors there, which I think is only about 70 or so. And um, I looking at them on the wall and my eye was drawn to something that I don't think I'd seen before. Now, we'll talk about the actual color in a moment. And I took it off the rack and I looked at the number. All of the floche color, floche numbers match up to DMC floss. So if you're stitching in, you know, DM, the red 321, it, and I think there's a floche of 321, and it's just labeled 321. Same red. But this didn't look familiar to me, and the number 651 didn't look familiar to me. Not that I have all DMC numbers memorized, but because this store is what it is, right over there was a full rack of the entire DMC threads, and I looked, and sure enough, there wasn't a 651. Even had a color card there, I double checked, no 651. I think this is an amazing color. Now, this is so hard to describe. And just like that fabric, it's not gonna come across per So here it is up against a, a white piece of fabric, of paper. Um, and it's sort of a light, light gray, a light, light lavender. I pulled a few threads to, to show you how hard it is to find. So 3747 is a lavender now. 
Yeah, that's coming across like it matches pretty good, but in person you would see this is a little darker. And it's this one clearly looks lavender, where uh, there's no way that I can hmm, get it closer. I get. I know it's looking like it's the same, and it's not. I also picked out a few light grays. Um, and again, you're just gonna have to trust me when I say none of these are perfect. Here is a light blue. Here is a nut. Well, here's an even lighter blue. This one's uh, 3756. Um, this is the problem when you're trying to do this on a video. Um, nothing really matches to it. I think, again, this one, which is 3747, is coming across as being the closest match. And in person, it's sort of like a slightly shade darker than what it actually is. I love this color. I wish it came as a floss. Um, I wish, uh, and I've double checked. It's not like it's a discontinued. Oh, so when I went home that night, um, cause I didn't, I was thinking, let me just strictly check on my phone. Like, no, I don't have time to do this right now. Um, I went through all the Floche numbers that are listed on the DMC website. Every single one of them, except for this has a floss equivalent. So why? Like, I want to know where this comes from. Um, like I said, I wish it had it in, in, um, Floss. I would love to stitch a monochrome piece with this. I'm trying to think what fabric would show it off the best. Um, and I may, it may be what I use. Uh, I, you know, I tend to not want to use threads in my designs that are particularly difficult or unique to find. Like I know cloche is not common, but I know it can be found. Um, and, but to, put up one that is particularly unique. I don't know. I just think it is such a pretty color and maybe one day you will see me using it. Right now, you can see how much thread you get. Um, and they don't even tell you, they just tell you it's 10 grams worth. So it's either 150 yards or 168 yards. Those are the two numbers that are in my mind. Um, right now, the piece I'm working on will definitely use one full skein. The problem is I started with half a skein. It doesn't matter, Hank, whatever. Anyway, try it out if you get a chance. Uh, what else? Oh, just very quickly, a little bit more thread talk. While I was there, I was wandering around. I was I was looking for some thread, not Weeks or Gentle Arts, because I'm, I'm good to go with those, that just had a, a color combination, not a, like a subtle color combination that really appealed to my eye. And I found one in Threadworks. It's blue with a bit of lavender. I really liked it. I decided, let me get this. I might do something with it. Threadworks is a six, it's a cotton and it's at six strands. I, I mean, I think they just use a DMC lace. Um, and it's just that, that, that kind of subtle over dye that I really like. Then wandering around, and I've seen this before, I don't think I've bought it before, is a thread that is 100% soy silk. Um, I, I don't quite understand how, how you make a thread thread out of soy, what, what this is. Um, it does indicate, I mean, you could see each, each strand it's, um, it's not stranded. Like this is what you get out of it. Um, and what does it say? How much did I have? 36 yards. So it's, it's basically like, cause it's not, it doesn't matter. Um, each strand is definitely thicker than a, um, regular floss and now I'm going to pair to my cloche. Yeah, it's about even, maybe ever so slightly thicker than that. Anyway, and again, I I walked away with it, one that's almost the same color combination, which is fine. This is just to play with. Um cuz again, I know this is not a common thread, but I'm just intrigued by the fact that it's made out of soy. And it reminded me also if you are not familiar with Mandarin floss, which is a rainbow gallery floss, is 100% bamboo. I love this stuff. I was recently organizing my threads and I realized how many I had of these and I wish I, I should go back and stitch with them more. Uh, it's six strands, very soft, um, more of a, a matte finish than a glossy finish, if that makes any sense at all. It, I just, this is a great thread if you ever have the opportunity to play around with it and just want to try something different because that's certainly a theme that I have in my needlework. Um, and what I share here on Floss Tube is trying something a little different. So 
as always, been going on longer than I thought I would, but I'm glad that I sat down today to share a bit with you. I hope everyone is doing well. I hope that um, as for me as a teacher, as I'm getting back into the swing of things of an academic year, we're here at the beginning and hoping that it's a good year, school year, whatever it is for you. Till next time.